Minister, I am Norwegian, so I speak Norwegian English. So if there are some words that you don't understand, please uh, shout out and maybe someone will explain it for you. On this slide here, you see 12 cross sections of root, different root species. And I want you to look very carefully because in the end of this presentation, there will be a quiz. <laughs> okay? And the one of you who have the most correct will have a poster. Hmm? So, you can't fall asleep now, can you? Hmm? <laughs> yes. Um, so this I will tell you about the project, the reason, the beginning of the project, the aim of it, the result and the end so far. Because I do not think this is finished yet. There are more to study about <coughs> roots and that's good. And of course here you see a large, you reckon that, it's a large. Uh, if maybe someone can shout out the, the Netherlands name. Larix. Oh, it's the vibe. Yeah, okay, Larix, yeah. But I'm not alone on this project. It's me. Uh, yeah, you see who's me. And uh, Olva Lundetre. Uh, we have done this as a spare time project beside our work, or we have done some in the working hours as well, but mainly uh, spare time. Because we wanted, uh, we needed this information. Uh, he is a European tree worker certified arborist and he has actually won the Norwegian tree climbing championship several times so he's a climber and he works also as a landscape uh, in a landscape gardener but he's most an arborist consulting <coughs> and climber <coughs> yes and uh, I do also teach at, um, at the um, agriculture school in Norway it's not as big as this school we have uh, 16 students every second year and this is my first group I have. So it's, that's very cool. Yes, and this is the start and the beginning of this project. It's an oak tree. It's in an uh, area they were go that's planning, planned for housing, new housing. They're going to take away all the other trees around it and save the oak. Why do they want to save the oak? Because it is over 200 centimeter in circumference and that means that is protected by a Norwegian law. And also it was very nice situated on the location so they could have the housing around and the architect also luckily found this tree nice. And well, so everyone in the project want to preserve this tree. And if you have a tree like this in Norway, in an urban area, you can apply to have it felled, but you will probably get the answer no. So you have to make sure that you can try to keep it and keep it safe also uh, after the building. And this is the law, it was made in uh, 2009. It's the Nature Divi Diversity Act. And it has been very helpful when this comes because then we actually can tell the builders that I have to save trees or oak trees. This goes special for oak trees. Then it's uh, the sentence here in Norwegian. You can probably not read it here. No? no? <laughs> but it's, that goes for oak. Yeah? Is this a, a national law? Yes, it's a national law. It goes all, all over Norway, but we don't have the oaks in the north. No, but still. And uh, maybe they can enlarge it to also include other species later on. That's what we hope, but still oak is the tree that lives longest in Norway. So that's why we have it. And we had to make this law because we did actually fell all our oak trees and export them to Netherlands, to <laughs> London, Venice. And we, mo we made some uh, chips in the in time, some um, ages ago, the Viking, yeah, and so that's why the, um, we lack housing areas for all the insects that lives on oak trees. So this is why this law has uh, come, and uh, why it's also 
lot of people with different interests that want to save the trees because they have different interests in the trees if they preserve insects or the tree themselves. Yes, so back to the project. This was what the architect planned for. Here you see a model of the oak tree. It's not totally the right, but still, it's the oak tree. And here you see the housing area. It's quite close to the, to the tree. And uh, I was asked to, okay, we have this oak tree. Can you please preserve this tree in the process? And I said, yes, maybe, but you have to move the house. How far? Did I ask how far do we have to move the house? Uh, we don't know, but we can estimate how far away the, the roots go, and we did. But we also did a bit survey on site, and you see here it's in the playground. It had been uh, filled up with um, gravel uh, here, and it's the top is very compact. The soil, you know, kids they are small, light, but they go outside in the rain and they compact the soil. So we had. Yeah, <laughs> you have kids here as well, I think. <laughs> so we tried to use the, um, the tomograph, and we have this strange result. It shows very... We didn't find out. This, this is not correct. This it doesn't tell where the root goes. Probably because of the, the gravel. And there is not so far to the stone underneath, the rock. So we did... Um, you know this type of method to air air spade yeah and we discover a mangle of roots like this is a bad picture I know but still you see here is a oops sorry no yeah lots of lots of root and at this point we could not tell which of these roots came from the oak tree and which belongs to the lilac the asher the poplars there were loads of different species at this site so we couldn't tell and we had just oh this is hard because we know that the oak trees have big roots and they go far away and we want to do, preserve as many as possible so we yeah but still we managed to draw something or at least we forced the architect and this is very important you have to do this you have to force the architect to draw the roots in the drawing and if you can even make them do it in 3D, it's the best because then it's inside the model and then other um, people see that there is something here that they have to take care of. So at least there are some roots here. They're probably not actually the right one, but there are still some. And we managed to, okay, we managed to ask them how um, much room do you need to build this? Oh, we actually need three meters. Oh, you don't have three meters. You have just half a meter. So then we have to squeeze them. And then I have to squeeze the building a bit further. So it's very, you have to have uh, some type, um, measurement about the roots to be able to do this. And of course, you can say, you always have this card. But if you don't do what I say, you won't have the project going through because the tree will die. That's because of the law. So that's very good. <laughs> Yeah, we started to study if there were any literature that could tell us is there any books about how to identify the roots on site. And yes, there are a lot of good, good, good uh, books about roots. But they are very thick and a bit complicated. And this one is in German, the Wörterlatlas. It's an extraordinary book. It's, it's very, very nice. I, I really recommended it. But it's not so easy to bring out in the field. And then you have an old book, which is quite good, but it's, uh, in, um, not a, it's in black and white, and it, has, it, has, it tells a bit. And of course, you need to have this one. This tells you very much about trees and how there are morphology in the tree. So I would recommend that one. So we started, we find out, okay, we have to do this ourselves because we wanted to look, we wanted to see how different tree species look like. And luckily, or I will say maybe unluckily, we have very good access to roots in Oslo city centre because they are digging everywhere, everywhere, and very close to the trunk. So here you see a trench intersection the root zone, and here it's quite close, I will say. I wouldn't re recommend this. 
but still then the trenches were open and it's quite a small community in Norway so people that had an open trench they could call us and we could come up and pick some samples. And we also had some sent over from an abandoned landscape um, nursery in, on the west coast. And we had the opportunity to go to the collection in the landscape laboratorium in Oslo where they have 100 different species and they were going to thin out the tree species so we, could, we were allowed to dig close to the one they were going to, that, that already had felt. So we could actually check that some of the findings we have found out in the city was correct with the one they had here. So that's the most scientific work we have ever done, okay? <laughs> so I will, I will remind you, this is not scientific work. This is our work out in the field. That's what I give you. So, so far, we have identified 50 different tree species. We have described the roots with photos and somewhat. We have focused most on the photos because we wanted something that was easy, accessible and easy to use outside. And we have made a very, very complicated, no, easy method for identification on site. And here you see four different species. And this was the first time we actually had four different species at the same time, like this. Isn't that quite amazing that they are so different? Or maybe not for you because it's actually not rocket science that roots should be that different because, you know, leaves are different, bark are different, so why should roots be the similar? Hmm? No, they're not. So here is the populars, Populus tremula, Salix caprea, uh, Birch, Betla pubescens, and um, Rowan, Sorbus arcuparia. You know those? Yeah. And it's quite cool that this one is pink. I, why should it be pink? Hmm? I don't know, but it's cool. <laughs> and we decided to use um, very simple or easy accessible tools for this project. Tools that you always bring with you or more or less always bring with you. Pruning shares. How many have a pruning chair? <laughs> yeah, almost all of you. How many have a camera on the phone, for instance? Yeah. And how many now have water? Not, maybe not here, okay. Bucket, you probably can have or something to wash the root in. And a spade, measuring tapes, quite normal. And then how many have my magnifying glass? There is some. I would hope that everybody could raise their hand now because this is a very important tool. You need it and it's very small and doesn't cost too much. So I think your company can afford it. And you need this for do this study better. So this is from our, one of our work site. It's, this is nice with the spare time project because you can just go out when it's nice weather. <laughs> <laughs> so here we were in the botanical garden and we did buy a micro lens. lens. So we could, that, that, that will be more or less the same you see in a magnifying glass. And we have this uh, soft box here to, to have more yeah, good, better light when we took the photograph. So here is what, or for most of us, I have not so good eyes. This is what you see with a normal lens or your normal eye. And this is what you see if you magnify it a bit. It's a Fraxness Excelsior. What will that be? Ash? Okay, uh, yeah. And here you see very clearly the vessels inside. Not so clear here. And uh, we use centimeters, so all the measurements, all the pictures have centimeters on them. I think you also use centimeters in this part of the world. <laughs> Not inches. <laughs> yeah. So why did we use one and a half to 1.5 centimeter diameter roots? They are big enough to study with your own eyes and phone camera and they are handleable. And this was one of the most common size we found in the trenches. I, so this is, we always found the roots that had this size, so that was good. And they have secondary growth. You know what secondary growth means? That means when you get fatter, you have secondary growth. When you're a teenager, you go up and then you get fatter. Hmm? So, so that is when you have more out. 
and we think that they are big enough to be removed from a tree without harm the tree. I will come a bit back to that later. So what do we see? This is very important. Visible anatomy. And here we have the first, I wouldn't say problem, but the first discussion. Because roots actually just, do you see the pictures? Yeah. The roots just have um, bark on the fine roots. Scientifically, we just call the bark and the tip of the fine roots on uh, like the tip here. But since this, and this is actually called periderm. But it looks like bark and it behaves like bark. And in some of the old literature, it's referred to as bark. So we decided to just use the term bark because that's easy. And if you are outside on a project talking to a digger and you have to explain something about the root, it's easy to say, I will look at the bark instead of look at the periodon, which actually is the, is the scientific name of the bark on the tree root. So that's why we use bark. And here you have um, uh, the lenticels or the bark pore. And you see on this Acea platanoides. What's that in. Uh, okay, yeah. And Populus alba. You see the, the lenticel here are along with the growth length, and here they are across. And that's a good sign for identification of tree species. And this is also where the gas exchange go on the, on the root. And this is the cross section. What do we see here? Anyone knows? We call it like this. We divide it into outer bark or periderm there. And then we have the inner bark. We have um, the xylem here and the medullary rays that goes from the center and out. And normally roots do not have a pit. Some species may have, but normally they do not have a pit like the stem has. And the vascular cambium, which is just a circle here, if you go back once, you can't see the vascular cambium, but you can see the difference between the xylem and the inner bark. <coughs> and of course you could divide this into a lot of different other things, but this is what we see. And here is a cross section where you can see the difference between xylem vessel and a sycamore or an Aeschylus cytoplatanus and a Quercus rub, a red oak. And look at these rays, huh? Small, tiny, fine rays. And here you have big, thick, white rays. It's quite cool. You didn't know this before, did you? No. <laughs> So we go back to the oak, the beginning of the project. This is Quercus rubber. And look at this also, oops, sorry, up, the thick, the thick rays here and all the vessels. And if you have the opportunity, you can cut a piece of this root and use it as a straw. It's quite, you have to suck quite hard to get the water up, but then you will feel the power of the tree that I struggle with every day. And that's how they go get the water up. And you can also actually see difference between the species just looking at the finer roots. We haven't studied that so much because we focus on this, si this size. But oh, uh, <laughs> here you see, if you look at the end, the tip on the end of the finer roots, you find they're more club shaped than on other species. So that's something more to look at. And I also brought a picture of a bit thicker root. This is also Quercus rubber. It's almost three centimeters. And I just brought this picture in because here you see a washed root and a not washed, and a don't wash, not washed root. That's the difference between those. And you still see the rays here. So you don't have to have the water to identify them either. You can actually identify them quite easily. And we wondered, does all the oak look the same? No, they don't. They look different. I'm not quite sure how many of these species you have. Some of them are from America. But see on this one here, you see all, you just see the vessels. You do not see the rays. And this one here, 
almost you see just like a mass, nothing. And then you have of course the nice one here with the white one here. And, uh, and this one is a cross of mix between this one and that one maybe. So there is actually different, yeah. Isn't, isn't, isn't this just a section you cut? Yeah. Because uh, the overcup oak, if you would uh, make a few more cuts, mm -hmm. maybe the race would come up or... Maybe, maybe if you cut more, but we did cut quite a lot into this root and we didn't find it on this one. Okay, not so, a No, but maybe if you do more studies you will find something else. But this was at least what we found on several roots from one single tree. Okay. Yeah. So the, the American species, we just have one tree to, to look at. And I have to tell you a bit about the Olmos glabra. You probably have some left here. Some left. So we need to take care of them, what we have. So that you need to know how the root looks like so you don't dig too close to them because they're very vulnerable. And this is what it looks like when it's um, uh, just um, we use the air tool. You see they're quite gray, but that's just the soil here. And here, this is quite funny. This was the first time we explored this, I will tell you now. Because when you cut, cut it, it's bright white. It's as white as the flesh of a coconut or a Jan Willems skirt. Shirt, yeah. <laughs> Let me have a look. <laughs> no, we're short, I'm not short. Yeah, sorry. But then, but then after a while, it gets yellowish like the one with the red head over there, the yellow skirt there, the yellow after a while. And that's because it oxidates. We didn't know that, but it gets whiter. And I also have um, orange spots on, like the bark pore. So here you see the fresh root, or as, as fresh as it gets from cutting, putting up and taking the photo. So it's a bit whiter, of course. And then after five minutes, it turns. It changed color. And not all tree species do this, just some of them. But the most funny about the Ulmus glabra is this. It creates a slime when cut. And I haven't seen this in so many other species. So this is quite typical for Ulmus glabra and not so much for the other ulm trees. And uh, we start, tried to find why does it why, why, what is it? And after a while, I figure out that this actually is used or were used when you were making bread in the old days. They used this slime. You can also have them on the, on the stem. And they took the slime and put it into the bread to make the, the bread stick together in the 18th century. Okay. And it's very nutrient. It's a quite sour, but it's still, it's, um, it's eatable. You can eat it if you want. <laughs> uh, you probably have quite a lot of tilia here. That's the most common planted tree in our cities. Tilia platyphyllus, it has, um, I think it's probably 90 or 80 percent of the trees in our cities, more or less, are tilia because it's a very easy tree to plant and easy tree to grow. We found out that this tree, this is this root here was actually just growing like this and when fresh you can bend it quite a lot and that goes for a lot of species when they are moisture and in the soil they are very flexible but as once they dry they get stiff so that's something to think about if you're going to move some roots you have to do it at once you can't wait you have to do it when you take away the soil and then you can move them. If you wait until the, the air dries it out, they will probably die and they will, will, will break. And if you look at the, this picture here, it's um, when it's wet, the color of the bark is more or less similar to when you pull out a tree and you have the, the, the branches in the spring. It looks quite the same in the color. <coughs> That's interesting and they also have some color changing in the cross section as well but it's quite orange in the inner bark and quite the white dish inside oops <laughs> and then we have the acer 
this is a wake-up call, okay? <laughs> it's a Norwegian maple. Uh, this is quite a normal way of um, the roots to grow, at least in our condition. I don't know if you see the same here. No. 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 You don't have this kind of soil, probably. But in cross-section, it looks like this. And it has this uh, orange uh, lenticels, a bark pro that goes in the length uh, direction. And it's quite whitish inside. It also turns a bit yellow after some in the air, but still, it's quite white. And if you compare this to the AC Campestre, you see there are some differences, but there are also some similarities. Oops, sorry. Here. You see they are quite the same thickness of the inner bark but still there are some differences. And the bark is, yeah, this was not the best picture, but still it has not the same uh, lenticels that this one. But the next picture I will show you. Now you have to be prepared because this is the, one of the nicest picture I have. <laughs> so breathe out. Okay, look at this, huh? Oh, come on, one more, huh? Whoa! <laughs> It's nice, isn't it, huh? Yeah, it's painted. It's not painted. <laughs> it's a horse chestnut. What do you call that? Yeah. Parkasan, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something like that. And uh, this is the interesting thing, except for it's very nice. It's bright white, and you have this uh, or brownish uh, inner bark. But look at the earrings or the annual rings, or what we can call it. We know that annual rings are not as uh, polite underground than above ground, because of the condition, maybe warmer underneath the ground or something. So they may be, maybe they don't tell exactly how old the root is. But we counted nine year rings on this one. So that has to mean something. So maybe this root is nine year old. And if you compare that one to a branch with the same size above ground, this will probably be one year or maybe two years. It can be older, of course, as well. And then you take, okay, you take away a branch of one year with no problem and you're pruning, that's okay. But you very seldom take away a branch that is nine year old above ground, because then it's a thicker, then it's thicker often. And this is just one centimeter. So think about that next time you cut roots. Yeah, you have to actually probably take away nine year of growth, maybe, or something like that. So we can't actually compare the size of the root with the branch branches. So if you take away all the roots on one side of the tree, you may take away a lot of, lot of, lot of growth without knowing it. So be careful about that or do at least think before you do it. And this also looks nice outside as well. Yeah. Did you find a ratio between root thickness and uh, branch thickness? No. I think it differs quite a lot because a bow ground can also differ quite a lot. But that's probably something you can study. <laughs> roots, roots don't, uh, when they are further apart from the tree, uh, there's no uh, energy that has to be um, stored into the uh, soil. Mm. It's, it's not it, uh, a tree branch that um, twig lives with the wind. So the wind load uh, forces a tree to make, to make thicker, thicker, yeah. thicker earrings. Mm. In, the, in the soil that's not needed. No, it's not needed. And there is no room for it either because in the soil, in the air, you have a lot of space that you can grow. There is no compaction, but in the soil, it's quite hard to grow because you have all the compaction as well. So you rather grow in the length than uh, outside. Depends a bit on, on the soil condition, of course. And the distance from the... And the distance from, yeah, distance. But at least there, that, this was new to me, so this is something to think about. Yeah. Did you also find uh, different uh, roots from the same tree? Because we were shown um, two roots, and one root was only for transport of water. So that was quite different root mm -hmm. than the normal one. 
Have we have also no, we haven't found that so easy so much. We have we have had the opportunity to cut quite big roots and quite thin roots, and we see very much similarities about when we are going to do the identification at least. Mm -hmm. There is some difference in the bark. There, there will be. Mm. And then um, the, the conifers, you probably dig around the conifers as well and you have probably noticed that you don't have to, you can actually close your eyes and you can dig and you can, whoa, you can smell the raise, raisin, the sap or the, um, what do you call it? The, the har harsh, yeah, the harsh. And they are very often very brown, um, orange, the, the roots. And you see here the, the droplets here, that's pippling out when you cut it. And if you, if you uh, com um, similar the Scottish pine with the Eastern white pine, you see differences in the, the, the raising channels. That's what is quite different. Here it's all over the place and here it's very ni nicely sorted around the cross section. But you have to look quite quick onto this because otherwise there will be this harsh everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we have the fabasa. And since I mentioned that you would use a root as a straw, I would not recommend to use fabasa as a straw because they can be poisoned. That's why we have this little head up here. But look at these three species. You have the Japanese pagoda tree, the black locust, and the golden chain tree, and they look quite similar, all of them. They have the thick white inner bark and yellowish outside, no, uh, yellow xylem. But if you look them on, this, on the bark, they're completely different. So you don't have to cut them to see what root it is. The golden chain tree or uh, laburnum is orange, and on the black locust you have those white stripes on them. Yeah. Um, it's not a question, but uh, I see many uh, people taking pictures. Um, you had a, an article of your book in the ISA magazine. Yeah. I translated that into Dutch for our magazine. It's not published yet, but it will be published somewhere soon. <laughs> so a lot of pictures um, are in that article. Yes. So, uh, at, you know, for the people. Uh, yeah, you can take pictures, yeah. of course, but uh, you know, a lot of stuff will be there in the, in the article. And it will be explained in Dutch. Yes. <laughs> so, that's good, yeah. <laughs> and this will also be recorded, this lesson here, and probably published... Yeah. Tomorrow will be. Tomorrow? Okay. So, if you fall asleep, there is a second chance. <laughs> yeah. And we have this one. This is also a very, very beloved root for me. I think it's very nice. It also changed color from bright white to orange. But it takes actually a couple of minutes. I think, we, I think it was like seven minutes before it actually turned orange. And that was a surprise because I thought it would be wow, cut orange. But it didn't. Is that on both sides? If you cut them here, it takes longer before it. Uh, yeah, the living side. Um, colorized on the other side? If you cut two pieces? Yeah, if you cut one, it changes. But how long does it take for the other side to do? I don't know. I didn't... We, we cut it and then we just laid it there and then we saw... It, it took more time than I believed it should take. I think it has to do with the, the oxygen coming into the... Yes. Into it, yeah. But the most interesting thing with this is this. Have you seen this before? It's a nitrogen fixing root noodle. <laughs> and look at it, it looks almost like a lung or a tree or something. And this is why Alnus glutinosa do not have autumn colors because they produce their own nitrogen from the roots. And when you're digging around some, such trees, you will find a lot of this around. And we also dug up uh, Alnus um, Incana. It's not in this presentation because it's not so gorgeous. It's not so nice as this one. It's very nice. And Ginkgo. Do you have Ginkgos here? 
They may smell, some people say, but they have extraordinary lovely roots. <laughs> huh? They are pink, and if you squeeze this hair, they are soft. They are squeezable, like a sponge. This hair, it can actually be squeezed. And it's totally pink, it's very nice. And it has this beautiful fabric in the texture. So if then we could make a dress or something of that, it would be nice, wouldn't it? And if you look at the finer roots, they are very tight into, a, we found, we have had three different samples of ginkgos, because we don't have so many ginkgos in Norway as well, but we have the three we have species of. No, no uh, kidding. But um, the, the finer roots were very close to the, um, the root with the secondary growth. And I don't know why, but this is one of the oldest tree. It lived almost when the dinosaur lived, so it probably have a good way of living, since it still survived. But it's, uh, you have to see this root, and if you have seen it once, you will know, oh, this is the ginkgo. You can't miss this one. And the yellow roots, there are lots of yellow roots that lies in the ground. This is the Euglas nigra, and uh, here they were going to make a cable uh, line for a digital TV, I think. So they used air spade, and you see the, the whole, um, uh, trench or a ditch is full of yellow roots. So if you know one of them, you can see oh, all this has to be saved. You cannot cut one single root here because you're not allowed to cut the root from this tree because that's what the order is. So you have to actually put the cable underneath all of it. And of course, a cover as soon as you have taken away the soil because they don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Is there an actually, is there an actual order not to cut? Yeah. In this one, in this case, yes. And in lots of cases there are, in Norway. In Oslo, I will say, probably. Not in Norway, in Oslo. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Maybe for the group, there's anything like that in the Netflix? Can you repeat the question? The, the question was, is there anyone in in this area, in this <laughs> group that knows if there is a similar law or a similar regulations for this in the Netherlands? And the answer was no. This is for the recording, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so probably not. But this is actually something that you can um, force into a project because when you are asked to preserve a tree, you can say to the owner of the project, okay, I can preserve a tree if you write the proposal for the digger that they, are not, that they cannot harm the tree and they cannot cut the roots and there have, has to be an arborist on site when digging is done. So that you can actually do, you can, you can force that into a project. And you have the Euglan Sinera, it's also yellow inside but not on the outside. <laughs> okay. And uh, this one is quite nice, because I thought, oh wow, it's yellow, it's cool. I put it in my pocket, and I was going to show it to someone the other day, and I took it up, and it was totally black. Oh, wow, it was yellow. <laughs> but then it was just to cut it off, and it was yellow, of course. So. And this, this was like finding gold. We did not know, we wanted to have the Morus Nigra in the English version because we don't have Morus Nigra in Norway, but we have one in the Botanical Garden. So we was allowed to dig there and we did not know what to find. And look at this, huh? I mean, the, do you know the black mulberry? Yeah. We probably have it, yeah? And look at the root. Look at this, huh? It's totally yellow hair and it has orange and purple lines. It was just wow! And Oliver wasn't on the side, so I had to send him a picture. Do you see this? It's so cool, huh? And I think the different moors have different colors underneath, but I don't know that. No, they're all the same? Okay, yeah. So, but there, yeah. So this was uh, very nice, and I would love to hear a reason for why do they have these colors. It's totally in the, in, the, in the earth. And this is the inside of it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite thick inner bark, 
we found. And you also see the, the spots there is probably, this is rotten here. And I was told that this, this tree has quite a problem with root rot. I don't know if that's, but this was actually here as well. Yeah, so then we come to the method of uh, the, um, how to identify roots in the field. Hmm? You excited? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, and this is of course on a lovely spot in the, um, in the university with nice shiny weather. There are no cars coming by, but on site there probably will be something else. And you probably have a digger or someone behind you that, go on, go on, can you please tell what word this is? So, but you need to have a tree and you need to have separate, uh, a lot of different trees because if you just have one tree, it's quite obvious which root the tree belongs to. So you have to wash it and study it. And that may be enough. So then you maybe know, you don't have to cut it. You can just say, okay, this is the oak tree or this is just by seeing on the pyridum. If not, you take, you cut it and you take a picture, enlarge it and use your magnifying glass which everyone has in their pocket <laughs> and enlarge it and study it and you can compare it to your own pictures from other projects or if you have the book that's one way of googling it or if you have probably you all are doing some digging project and maybe you can take picture and share them so that you can have more because we don't have all the species in the book so there are probably more to, to have. But at least then you know, for instance, in this case here, there were two different trees along the road. There was just one in the picture here, but it was Ace Platanoides and uh, horse chestnut. So the horse chestnut were going to be felled, but not the Ace. So then they don't have to take so much care of the, the, the one root. So then we had okay. Then you see here. You have a sample of one of the roots and you can have a little sample you can have and, and go along the trench and tell, okay, this root preserved, this root preserved, this one you can cut. And that can save money and it can save time. So that's why it's one use of this thing, knowledge. And often you come out on a site like this and this is um, <clears throat> where they are going to do the digging. And the tree is not on the picture because we're not always taking picture for good presentations. So the tree is about here. So, and we know, okay, they're going to do some digging here. And then since this is Oslo Commune, the digger has to have an arborist on site to watch that the tree is not, not harmed too much. And you have to actually, tell how many roots are cut and you have to take a photo of it and the diameter and distance from the trunk. That's the arborist's work to do. And if it's too much to take off, maybe you have to fell the, the tree. So this is from several different projects. You may, do, you may use a um, uh, digger yeah, to, uh, to take away the soil in the beginning and then you maybe use uh, a vacuum um, cleaner vacuum vacuumer yeah and you end up like having something like this and this is quite interesting or i think it's interesting otherwise i wouldn't show it to you um here you see infrastructure underneath the ground and a lot of roots they want to grow where it's uh, good soil and this is often the place to grow and if you're going to move something around here you have to be careful if you can you cut all these roots or can you not of course it's much easier just to cut them and then cover it and that's it but then maybe if there is something you have there you can see there is a tree over here maybe you don't have you are not allowed to cut this root or maybe if you cut them the tree will die 10 years later so then maybe you should move over here to do the installation and and if you know if you if you are sure to say what type of root this is it's easier on site to say 
stop, we have to rethink, we have to reprogram pro pro the project and we have actually to move the project over here. Or we have to say, yes, you can build here, but then we have to fell the tree. Do you want that? Do the owner want that? So we have to be very clear about the consequences. And that's easier when you know what route you're talking about. And this is another example of the royal little castle where they were going to build some um, bridge or a fence or something here. And you see the roots coming over here. And here they actually placed the fundaments. Yeah. Uh, and, and they placed the fundaments uh, not on the roots, but beside the roots. It's uh, that's a, it took quite a lot of time, but still the tree lives. And this was another example. It was quite, uh, yeah. What can you say? Um, the the um, the project. The owner asked, "Do you know if there is any roots in this area?" Uh, yes. I mean, you see the trunk here. It should be roots quite close to the trunk. It's not rocket science to say yes, it is. But now, but are you totally sure? Because we want to have, uh, we want to dig here, and um, okay, you can dig because there, there had been some, done some digging before because they had had uh, uh, power lines or something in the ground before. You see here, there is something, and they wanted to see if there had been regrowth around here as well. And yes, of course, we did find roots quite close. It's not very, very <laughs> burning news, I will say, but still, this, this um, discover made them actually move the, the trench two meters further away, and then they also had to rebuild a stair and move the house they were going to plan over a bit over there because they were not allowed to fell this tree. From there was the communa that owned the tree, and then they say, no way. Is there a maximum diameter uh, for not to cut the, the roots? A minimum diameter? Minimum diameter is, uh, if, if it's a com communa tree, it's five meters no, from the stem. The, oh, from the stem? Okay. Yeah, okay. from the so stem. Even if it's only uh, this thick, you're not allowed to cut it. Uh, the, the thumb rule is five from the communa, and then you have to discuss. Yeah. Everything in closer to the stem than five meters, you have to discuss. And maybe it's okay, maybe not. So there is some sort of discussion room there. Mm. And we have this uh, project here. Uh, here is, um, you see the, the bush or the shrubs over here? And um, the architects wanted to have a house here. And I said, that's no problem, because we just take away the, the shrubs and there will be no roots here from this uh, tree. Yes, there will be. And we had a vacuumer on site, so we could do some, um, we could do some testing and see if there were actually oak, oak roots underneath here. And yeah, here is the vacuumer. And I took some um, samples here and more into the, the into the shrub, the shrubs. And of course, there were lots of roots there. Yes, <laughs> and there were two roots there. There were two two different roots. Do you know what do you see here? Oak and shrub. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the oak and the shrub. <laughs> And that's quite um, cool to be on site and see. Oh, do you see the difference here? And this is the oak and this is the shrub. And then you get more, po you say pondus out in the field? You get more power or, yeah. yeah. Pondus is more, <laughs> yeah. And this is a very interesting project. It's an, um, Two, 120 year old uh, Acer Platon readers. This project was uh, in 2011. And they were allowed to build a garage underneath the tree and 
they were allowed to save the tree. Or not allowed, they were forced to save the tree, but they could build underneath the tree. And you see it's quite tight here, it's quite narrow area, so they wanted the underneath garage here. And the, the, this is Oslo Kommune and they said, okay, you can build here, but you have to be five meters from the stem of the tree. But of course, to be five meters from the stem, they also dig some closer as well. So here you see some of the roots coming out. And they were uh, wrapped with um, some fabric in the beginning and after a while they built some wooden, wooden uh, chases around them and had some water and maintained them during all the process. And the digger in the beginning, he said, oh, what's this? Is this important? It's just a big shrub. Oh, yes, but <laughs> if you take away the big shrub, you may not be allowed to do the rest of the project. So it's quite important that you actually take aware of this big shrub. And after a while they actually fell in love with this big shrub. And they were very, very careful about it. So the digger were very nice around, but the last day, of course, he cut one root and he was very, very sad. But the still, the tree still, yeah, yeah here is the roots, yeah. The, st the tree still lives, but it loses more or less one big or biggish branch every year. And I don't think it had that had happened if not this project had been true. So this project, it shows that you, as an arborist, or at least if you have the role as an arborist, you have the responsibility to talk for the tree. The tree doesn't talk. So you are actually the tree's voice out in the field and you have to be there and you have to be sure that the other on site understand what you are telling them, that this is how the tree will be, can survive. And then you need to have the knowledge and you need to show that you have the knowledge and you need to be courageous, I've written, because it's not always easy when you have like, you know there are 10 people there and the time's running Everybody's playing dumb. Everybody playing, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's so easy uh, in Norway to uh, just uh, move things like buildings, like because of the license uh, has to be changed? Or? No, it's not easy. But it can be done. Yeah, but it mm -hmm. take weeks? Yes, probably. it takes weeks. It takes a long time. And that's why, but that's also, if, if they had got a permit to build this, this project here, and the permit says you are allowed to build this project if you take care of the tree. And who knows what's, how to take care of the tree? That's you. And you have to be there because the tree, they just stand there and they won't say anything. They, they don't have a mouth. So you have to tell the, the other people on the theme that you are actually there for the tree. And they can laugh of, of you in the beginning and, oh, that's not important. We had lots of trees in the forest. But still, if they cut down the tree or the, the reason for the tree, the, the project made the tree die, then the project is not a su success. So you have the responsibility to make sure that the tree survives. Yeah. But the project is finished. The project is finished. And your tree is dead. It still, it still lives. Now. No, no, I mean, there's, there's a lot of projects here. Yeah. Uh, we, we saved the tree. Mm. We've done everything uh, we could to save the tree. Yeah. And in five years' time or in ten years' time, the tree is eventually dead because of the project. Yeah. There's no one here in the Netherlands that will complain after ten years no. uh, that the tree has died. And that's. That, that's a problem because now. <coughs> yeah, here you see more of the project. Uh, and this, the, trill, the, the tree still lives. The owner of the project, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that puts a thing in perspective because we are just human beings. We do not live as long as the tree does. So we actually have to be very brave and we have to tell this story to the decision makers. And we have to tell them that we not just only take care of the roots, 
we have to take care of the environment around the roots because the roots and the tree needs food. It needs water, it needs microorganisms, it needs all the things that live in the soil. So if you don't take care of all these things, the tree will eventually die because of all our thing. And since we use like three months extra on this, and it costs like uh, yeah, 100,000 euro extra, it, it's not worth it if it doesn't make the tree live way longer. So that's, it's a very important role. So I will go back to this and you really have to tell this again and again and again. The tree need to be saved and you have to save this root and you have to save this, this um, area of soil to make sure that the trees will survive. And if you just lack one meeting on a building site, the tree could be dead. And that is also something you have to take into your planning when you are on site and following a tree. It's not, you cannot just come by and say, okay, it looks good. No, you have to be there and you have to tell all the diggers because the diggers may be replaced next day. There may be a new person in. So you have to make sure that they actually know what they're doing. And you have to a difficult part, but you have to actually make them understand and feel the responsibility for taking care of the tree. And since they are usually, I, I found that most of the diggers, they are done, they do exactly what you tell them to. Maybe the foreman doesn't care so much, but if you speak to do the one that actually do run the machinery, and you, you have to speak to that person, not the foreman, the one that are in the machinery, and you have to speak to him in a language that they understand. Russian. So, yeah, Russian. maybe Russian or Polish or something. And you also, there is one more important thing. You don't have to come in and be like the upper class person that knows everything. You have to respect the person. Then they will respect you and they will respect the tree. And see that this is a uh, um, purpose for all of the project. Yeah. What is the effect on the roots by digging them up? Because uh, there are uh, a certain while uh, out of the ground. Mm. What does that, that new environment do with the roots? It can harm them. Uh, I mean, if you don't cover them quite quickly, because you take away the micro roots if there were any, and you take away all the microorganisms and all the ecosystem that around them. So then you have to put that again into it and you have to make uh, the, the new soil good for the tree and that will take a while. So then you actually have to treat the roots as babies in the beginning because it, it, you have to create new ecosystems around the roots. So that's why I, I, I do not like this to, to take away so much soil. I would prefer to more or less take, save the whole area. That would be better. Yeah. Do you uh, do in Norway or in, in Holland before a construction like this? Usually you, you do something, we call it a tree effect analysis. You have to make a report how does this construction affect the life of the tree? Does something like that exist in Norway? Yes. The question was if we do um, uh, a research uh, before the project starts to see the effects of the tree. And yes, I would say we have some rules or regulation to do that because of this uh, new law that we have to make, or we have to answer the, the law and the text in the law. And for all oak trees, we have to make uh, analysis to see the consequences of the project. And then the decision makers can see, okay, the oak will maybe live, lose half the lifetime, but that's okay, or not. Only with oaks? That's only with oaks we have to do it, but uh, they can ask for more. So, but that's more volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. What's the fine when you break the law? <laughs> oh. <laughs> the, the fine may be that you won't. In the beginning, the fine will be that you are not allowed to do the project. If that's a, it's not a fine, but still. And if you cut down trees before, the fine will be decided 
may be in court or depends who owns the tree. If the owner is the commune, it could be 40,000 euros, maybe, something like that, half a million uh, in Norway, in Norwegian krona. Yeah, it's money, yeah. But um, so you're not allowed to do the project before you have done an analysis through the Nature Act law. So there is something. Yes. So, why is it interesting? Maybe I don't have to ask this question here. <laughs> but it's very seldom that roots are explored like this oak tree, no, um, beech, be yeah, beech tree. These persons here are normal size Norwegians. <laughs> it looks quite tiny. <laughs> yeah, and this is probably <laughs> this is probably just half the size of the half the root system. So usually you see trees like this. This is a typical tree. This is a pear tree. And when you come here and are you going to make um, or someone are having a project here, they will probably think, okay, you see here, maybe we can do something from this side and out because you don't see what's underground. So that's why we need to tell the architects more about what's underneath. What's hidden is not forgotten. Uh, yeah, so like we have this case when you, as when you, it happened when it was a bit snowstorm in Norway. Uh, it's not so easy to see here, but you see there are no roots here. And here is quite a newly dug area. And the owner says, no, we didn't know anything about this. <laughs> because, but uh, they have dug away everything, everything around this tree. And that's why it fell over. So if maybe we could give this information to also some of the diggers, they could see, okay, but if we dig close and we see the roots that belongs to this tree, that could actually, f in this case, <coughs> two cars, one, no person would wear them harmed but still two cars is quite much and the tree, and the tree yes of course <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah Where is that? Uh, that. yes and then we go back this is the, actually the first Norwegian book here where we're happy and uh, we managed to collect all our samplings into the Norwegian book thanks to the Nordic Fund for Your Urban Trees and if anyone have a project, I would recommend to apply for this, although it's a Nordic fund because they may give you some money. It's not big money, but it's money to at least have a contract with um, a publisher that could do the publishing of the book. And we had um, um, the, Ab the Agriculture Association to um, translate and publish the English version. So it's available in England and US. And I also found it on a Netherlands website, but it was very expensive <laughs> on that one, yeah. Uh, yes, and this is how it looks like when I have uh, conferences. And I think it's quite interesting that so many people come to hear about this. And the, the most funny thing about this is that afterwards people say, oh, this is cool. <laughs> But this is actually something I see all the time. And now I have been this, talking about this quite a lot of places and but. people think that it's, it's what I see actually in the field outside. So that's interesting. Yeah, and here it's um, just some um, up where you can have the book. And there are some articles, one in English, one in Spanish one in Norwegian and in German and in Dutch quite soon. Thanks to Bas. Yeah. And yeah, oops, sorry. Okay, there are more to describe. So I said, which, sorry, which one is next? Yeah, yeah it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> no, okay, I forgot. I, I reckon you all want to know what this looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this, huh? Just this is the first. This is the first picture of this this root. Um, this is one tree. So I'm not quite sure if everybody looks like this, but isn't this a piece of art? Yeah. It's 
very nice and it's pink um. <laughs> just like pink things huh <laughs> and look at the pink outside and here you have the american sweet gum and if you taste the name liquid amber liquid amber liquid amber and you see and you cut something and you see oh it's this is shiny and after a while it starts to bleed liquid amber oh. <laughs> yeah so now it's quiz time <clears throat> I don't know if you have anything to write on. You can write on your phone. Did you, did you have to discuss with someone? So, and we will do it like this. Then you can write down, and the one that have the most, or there will be the, the two ones that have the most, will have a poster each. Okay? Are you ready? So, what do you see? <laughs> okay, do we, can we, uh, do we, can, can we find out who uh, had the most correct? Okay, so if everybody had one correct, raise their hand. One correct. One correct. Okay, and you can just two. How many had two correct? No. Oh. Three. Still. Four. Oh. Five. Oh. Six. Oh. Seven. So six. Six is the most. That means that you have the middle hair. Oké, okay. oh zo goed. Um, we are able um, to move um, major trees uh, by cutting uh, all the roots around the stem. Uh, we can do that very successfully. If you see that in uh, perspective with some projects, what can you tell us about regrowth of roots when they are cut? Thank you. Uh, the regrowth, we see, I haven't studied that much, but what I have seen that when you cut the root, there will be lots of new roots coming out. And you have to treat the, the moved tree as a new planted tree. So you have to water it a lot. And I think also the tree will generate more uh, root from the base as well to, to that they can stabilize themselves. But I know there is some project on actually that team in Florida and also in New Zealand. So I hope we will have some more results on that because then they have actually cut trees from quite a long time ago and they are now digging them up again to see how the tree respond on exactly that question you have. Come on fast, Bas. Okay, oh yeah. Um, in the Netherlands, we have uh, like um, a common thing. Uh, if it, a root is five centimeter thick, you can cut it without uh, damaging the um, uh, the tree. And if it's thicker, it's an uh, important root. But you showed that uh, you know one centimeter is already nine nine years. So. Um, how do you think is there something you think uh, the thickness of a root which you cannot cut because it will harm the tree or is there a number you think of or a thickness of the root yes i think i can answer that question it's quite hard to answer it and the answer is we do not know. We do not know what harm we do to a tree when we cut the roots, because we do not know how many tree roots there are left 
for the tree. And we do not know where the tree roots grow. They may grow 17 or 30 meters from the stem into a basement where there have been potatoes or something. Or they can go into the, uh, the, the cloak, the seward, or something like that. So we don't know, but we can estimate and we can say if you cut big roots, there will be a risk of declining vitality. There will be a risk of a tree falling over later because of root rot or uh, something else, or you may take away the stability. And if you take away a five, five uh, centimeter thick root, it's quite thick. And you think, I, th I will recommend then that you probably dig a bit further out and see how, how um, old is this root and then you go in and see how big it is and how old it is because we cannot see we, I, th I don't think we can use centimeters to to tell if this root is too thick to take away you have to see the condition and the, um, the tree species and if there is maybe you don't have so many mountains here or, or a ground uh, mountain you have probably sand or a loam, a lot of so, so they're probably more similar for the root, root, but you have to see if there are other construction or something in the ground that make you cannot take roots on this side because on the other side there is a house, so you know there probably won't be so many roots over there. So the answer is we do not know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we want to finish the first part. Um, and I would like to say thank you so much, Christine, for, um, for the wonderful work you and your colleague did. Um, it's impressive, all this work. Yeah? yeah, because I have told you that this is a spare time project, and it is. And I am telling you that because that means that all of you can do something and you can also tell the rest of the world about it. And maybe you can, and I think sharing is the most important thing we do in this industry. So if you have something clever, or something not maybe so clever, but still there is something new, share it with everybody. <laughs> I'm not angry, I'm not angry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, and Christian will be here for the rest of the afternoon, so I, uh, I suggest we will have a short break now. Okay. Let's, make it, let's make it a very short break. Toilet, um, and then uh, we finish um, the Algemeen Ledenvergadering, the annual general meeting. And then afterwards, during the drink, you can ask all your other questions. But for now, thank you so much. Thank you. Christian.